Hi there folks, welcome to episode 5 of my pelvic floor mini series. So, so far um, in the series we've looked at what the pelvic floor is, we've looked at the relationship between the pelvic floor and the bladder, we've looked at the relationship between the pelvic floor and the bowel, um, and we've also looked at how to do a pelvic floor exercise um, effectively and correctly. Um, so today we're going to look at the pelvic floor and pregnancy and birth. So I know a lot of the women that I work with who are watching this are working with me because they are pregnant or they've had their children um, or they're seeking guidance from me um, for antenatal support. Um, so yeah, so this will probably be hitting home for a lot of my followers. Um, in the earlier videos, we established that um, Pregnancy and birth is not the only reason that we have issues with our pelvic floor, but there certainly is a really strong correlation. Um, so when we are pregnant, we're encouraged to do our pelvic floor exercises, and then after we've had our babies, um, and we are very aware of those issues that we can face having had children. So let's have a look at why that um, is an issue uh, for women when they have children. So, um, when we are pregnant, um, hormones change. We have a, a shift in our hormones and there's one additional hormone that starts to fly around our system. And that hormone is called relaxin. And relaxin is a hormone that allows our uterus to expand and grow and um, allows our bones and our ligaments and everything to be a lot more supple so it allows movement through the pelvis so it's not just to facilitate the growth of our baby but also to assist in giving birth as well so it's the hormone that sort of makes us all loosey-goosey when we are pregnant um, and that hormone is great uh, but it does um, potentially cause some issues as well. So um, when we're exercising, when we're pregnant, there is um, the potential to overstretch and things like that because suddenly we're more flexible than perhaps we were previously. So it can predispose us to um, injury when we're pregnant and exercising. Um, and also that hormone will stay in the system after we've had our babies for up to five months. So when we're doing exercise postnatally, it's really important to consider that as well. So the relaxing hormone will have an effect on the pelvic floor as well. So we know that it's a complex um, network of muscles um, and ligaments in there, sphincters. So when we've got this relaxing hormone, it just makes that area of muscle potentially more lax. Um, and when we're pregnant as well, obviously there's a lot of weight um, that we're carrying around. So this additional weight is putting pressure through the pelvic floor. And then obviously as our pregnancy progresses, we get closer to giving birth. Um, and we know that birth will involve the baby coming down and through the pelvic floor, um, which of course is going to be causing some stretching, um, some potential damage to those muscles and nerves as well. Um, and baby has to then uh, come through often with some pushing and things like that, which is all putting pressure down through the pelvic floor. So they're the reasons that we will see um, problems there. Um, but I think in the Western world, when we have our babies, um, there's sort of additional risk factors um, and things that can cause us to have more problems with our pelvic floor. Um, birth in, in the UK um, and in a lot of other Western countries is very much a medical event. Um, it's not a natural event that sometimes needs uh, medical assistance. It's very much uh, a medical event that sometimes will um, sort of happen naturally, which is such a shame. I, I want it to be a natural event that sometimes needs uh, medical assistance. So we have a lot of medical intervention with birth. Um, be it caesarean, be it forceps delivery, one twos delivery, um, episiotomy, so uh, a cut, an incision in that perineal area. Uh, we find that um, a lot of women will end up birthing on their back, which is uh, something that's not really optimum, um, which can then again put a lot of pressure as we're trying to bear down and push our baby out. Um, we have quite a lot of sort of coached pushing, um, this purple pushing, women not necessarily tuning in with um, 
what their body is telling them to do. Uh, so it could be that they've had epidural um, analgesia is, is a way of coping with their birth. So when they've had that, they're then having to really push um, down and through. So um, this very medicalized approach to birth will often mean that we can potentially cause more damage um, as we are birthing our babies. Women that have caesarean sections will often think, oh, I won't need to worry about my pelvic floor. But actually, when we think about those women that have had their C-sections, they've carried their baby um, for, you know, a, a good length of time. So they've had that relaxing hormone, that additional weight through their body. But also a lot of caesareans um, that are carried out are carried out in an unplanned scenario. So for those women, they've been laboring. They could have got to second stage where they are bearing down and pushing. So we would have already had that impact through the pelvic floor. So yes, vaginal delivery will have the biggest impact through the pelvic floor. But if you've had a cesarean section, it's still very, very important important that um, we look to help um, you recover and uh, try to encourage that pelvic floor to get back to normal function. So what can we do? So when we're pregnant, um, we want to be keeping as mobile as possible, really working with our pelvis, keeping mobile. So it might be that you want to attend some pregnancy yoga. You might want to attend a pregnancy fitness class, make sure we're getting some squatting and all of those really good compound functional exercises. Um, you might want to work with a personal trainer when you're pregnant as well. Um, but we certainly want to be connecting in with the pelvic floor. So you can do lots of functional activities which will activate the pelvic floor without this sort of conscious squeezing. So there's lots you can do. Um, but we do want to be working the pelvic floor through pregnancy. So there's myths out there that will say that you don't want to be doing pelvic floor exercise during pregnancy because it'll become too strong and that'll hinder birth. But my goodness, you'd have to be doing a lot of pelvic floor exercises to have that much of an impact through the pelvic floor. So my advice to the women that I work with um, in pregnancy is yes, do the um the lifts um, and the releases that I talk about in episode four. So engage, learn to connect with this part of your body. So as your pregnancy progresses, you might find that it's easier to do your pelvic floor exercises lying down, to take a little bit of that pressure off, and that's absolutely fine. But I think through pregnancy, it's definitely developing this connection, this understanding of the sensations of this area of your body. And I really feel strongly that that will help you during labor, if you know how to engage these muscles, but also how to release them, knowing what the sensation of having a really relaxed pelvic floor feels like is only gonna be supportive as you are um, laboring and birthing your baby. Um, I'm a hypnobirthing teacher, so um, I teach comprehensive antenatal courses. Um, and throughout that course, we touch on lots of different things that you can do um, to have the most um, natural um, birth possible with the least amount of intervention. And throughout that course, we would talk about breath work um, and breathing exercises are awesome for the pelvic floor. So we can breathe in and lift and engage and then exhale and, and release. All of these little breathing techniques you can learn from a good hypnobirthing uh, teacher and sometimes some really good yoga teachers as well, particularly if they're interested in birth. So breath is amazing. Um, but also we will talk about optimal birthing positions. So if we can get into a great birthing position, um, we're going to sort of let gravity assist. So we're not going to have to be pushing until we're purple in the face to birth our babies. And it's all supportive. Um, so optimal birthing positions. We talk about ways to try to prevent tearing as well. So the perineum is attached to the pelvic floor. So if we have extensive tearing or cutting to that area of the body, these highly medicalized births will, will often result in 
problems with the pelvic floor. So if we can look at optimal birthing positions, try to prevent tearing, um, so looking at different ways of doing that, um, and also learning to um, tune in with your body, to trust it, to know how to support the central nervous system so you can get oxytocin flowing, so that hopefully you can steer away from intervention. Um, and yes, hypnobirthing doesn't promise you a pain-free or um, a birth without intervention, but it's certainly going to um, support you in going down the right path for a more natural um, delivery. So I feel that when you're pregnant, preparing for your birth, um, getting some good um, education will help you manage your pelvic floor symptoms. And then having had your baby, we want to start working with that pelvic floor um, quite soon after you've given birth. So I'm talking in the days um, after giving birth, we want to start to switch them on. We know about the problems, with the bowel and the bladder, you might have hemorrhoids there. So we want to start activating this muscle as soon as possible. And I know for me, when I first tried to activate my pelvic floor give, having given birth, I felt like I could feel nothing at all. Um, so I just worked on doing the lifts while I was laying down and then gradually um, started to work to a seated position, standing and gradually work from there. And again, um, women's health physios, um, good uh, postnatal personal trainers can support you with that and your midwives as well um, will give you guidance on when and how often um, you need to be working uh, your pelvic floor. So yeah, so there is a really strong connection with pregnancy, birth and issues with the pelvic floor. And then as we go into later life, we have hormonal changes again with the menopause and, and things like that. So um, although it's not the only risk factor for pelvic floor, it's not the only predisposing factor, yes, uh, pregnancy and birth will definitely have a big impact on your pelvic floor. So don't let it be the bottom of the list for you. Um, when we're pregnant, it things run away. We've got to think about a buggy, a car seat, uh, the nursery, um, packing your hospital bag. And we've got this big list of things that we need to do often while we're still working full time. And the pelvic floor is there in the mind, but will often get put to the bottom of the list. Um, so I'm strongly encouraging you now um, to think about your pelvic floor and definitely look um, at getting some birth preparation under your belt, keeping as active as possible, whether that's uh, fitness, yoga, maybe both, um, is awesome during pregnancy. And then after you've given birth, slowly, gently start to activate those muscles so that you can recover. We do not have to put up with ongoing symptoms having had um, children. Don't feel that you have to just put up and shut up. If you're having issues with um, the perineum uh, sensation there, any pain, any pain during sex, ongoing urinary leakage, any bowel problems, please speak with your GP and um, let's look to get it sorted out. Um, if you've got any questions, please drop them below, send me a message, um, check out the other videos if you haven't already, and we've still got more to come. Um, so please subscribe to my channel and then you'll get reminders as and when videos are ready. Thank you very much.